Hey, good morning, everyone. Man, it's good to be in church today. My name is Josh. If we haven't met, my wife and I are part of the lead team here at Active Church. And uh, we're back, y'all. We're back. We've been getting lots of text messages and phone calls like, where are you guys? You all right? We're good, man. We, uh, for the first time since we launched Active, uh, my wife and I took a, a season of Sabbath, a season of rest. It's God's idea, right? And life is better when you do things God's way. And uh, so we took Sabbath and uh, man, we are back. We're refreshed. We're ready to go. Are you ready? Let's do this. Hey, we're going to be hanging out in the book of Psalms, we typically do this here at Active Church. We uh, hang out in the book of songs during the summer and just check out all the different songs that David wrote. And so we're going to be hanging out in Psalm chapter 139. 139. You're going to want to take lots of notes today. I've got lots of scripture to share with you. But this is what I know, that the presence of God is in this place. And if we lean in and we open our hearts to hear from him. I believe that we could be, leave different than when we came and we could leave with the fresh revelation, revelation of who God is in our life. Do you believe that? Yeah. Hey, before we jump in, would you get loud with me for just a moment and let's show some love and honor to our lead pastor, Pastor Otto Magana. Come on, you could do better. We love you, Pastor. We're better because of you. And uh, man, we're thankful for you. Psalm 139. Any fans of the ocean? Any surfers out there? I have a love-hate relationship with the ocean. I, um, a, a few years ago, we were on vacation. And uh, there was a, the, we were staying at a hotel and the ocean was right behind the hotel. And uh, was there with my brother-in-law, my nephew. And uh, we were just hanging out. We thought, hey, let's, let's, uh, it was in the evening and uh, like just before sunset. We're like, hey, let's, let's get our snorkeling gear and go see what we can find in the ocean. You never go in the ocean when the sun's going down, just FYI. And uh, I wasn't expecting much because, you know, like there weren't no reefs or anything cool like that. But we thought, ah, let's just go and see what we can find. So we put our snorkeling gear on. We went out in the ocean and was snorkeling and uh, came across this sea turtle. It was honestly the, the, the largest sea turtle that I've ever seen. Like its shell was, you know, bigger than me. And it was just, you know, going in the ocean. And so I started following it. And, and it was super cool just watching the beauty of this turtle. And I was so like zoned in on this turtle, checking it out. I kind of lost where I was in the water. And I noticed something beneath me. And when I looked down, like it was so close. Yeah, you know where this story is going. It was so close, I felt like I could touch it. And I looked down as I'm following this turtle in my snorkel gear in the ocean, and it's a shark, y'all. It may have been a four or five feet shark, but it felt like a 12 foot shark. It might have been a reef shark, but it felt like a great white shark right underneath me as I'm following this turtle. And I did what you're probably not supposed to do if you come across a shark in a body of water. Like I was telling myself, like, Josh, stay calm. You're going to be all right. But then I envisioned this shark, like, <laughs> biting me in half. And, yo, I raised my head up, and I yelled, Shark! <laughs> And I took off swimming and kicking and screaming. Like, I was walking on water, y'all, to get out of that water. So focused on that turtle <laughs> that I forgot what was around me and forgot that I was swimming in the presence of a great white shark. <laughs> I think that's a lot like us, isn't it, when it comes to life and God. <laughs> like we get so focused on all of the other things that life brings our way that we tend to forget and have an awareness of God in our lives. Like sometimes it's not even intentional. Like it's not deliberate. 
It's not ill-willed. Like we just get busy <laughs> and forget about God. Like we get so busy with work. We get so busy with family. Anyone get so busy being like a personal Uber driver for all of your kids, driving them all over? Yeah, come on, somebody. Like we get so busy that we forget about God in our day-to-day -day lives. And we lack the awareness of his presence in our lives. Sometimes life, man, life is just tough. We live in a broken world and life happens. And sometimes we go through seasons that are just painful. Sometimes we go through seasons that just hurt. Sometimes we are just broken as a result of this broken world that we live in. And if we're not careful, we get so zoned in. We get so focused on that hurt. We get so focused on that pain. We get so focused on that thing that we forget about God. And we lack the awareness of his presence in all of that. And sometimes, sometimes if we were real, like we just experience seasons in life, events in life that just plain suck. And it's so wrong and it's so hurtful and it's so not fair and it's so not right that we ask ourselves not just how could this happen, but I think if we were honest with each other today, we ask ourselves not just how did that happen, but God, where are you in all of this? I think King David could relate to a lot of those emotions, a lot of those feelings, a lot of the reality of this world that we live in today. Like if you think of King David in scripture, like I think he could relate to you and I a lot. Like King David had a lot of really high highs in his life, didn't he? Like you think of King David, dude, he went from a shepherd boy to a king. Like that's a promotion. Like we think of David, he's like, dude, that is the guy that fought and killed Goliath. That's my boy right there. That David, a man after God's own heart. Like David experienced some really high highs in life. And yet he also experienced some really low lows in life, didn't he? That's Sheba. Not only did he have an affair with a woman, but then he plotted a murder to cover up the affair. High highs, he had some low lows. And I think because of the reality of the life that he lived, experiencing really high highs and really low lows, I think that's what led him to writing this scripture in Psalm 139. I think it was used as a reminder for him and it can be used as a reminder for us today of the reality that no matter where you're at in life, whether on the mountaintop or the valley low, that the truth is that God is always with us. God is always with us. Check out what Psalm 139 verse seven says in the message translation. Is there any place that I can go to avoid your spirit? Is there any place that I could go to avoid your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, <laughs> you're there. If I flew on the morning's wing to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. Why? Because you're already there waiting. Isn't that cool? Where is God right now in this moment? The answer would be that God is everywhere. He is everywhere. If I climb to the highest sky, he's there. The lowest depth, he's there. If I God is everywhere. The Bible says that he neither sleeps nor slumbers. And if God is everywhere, then that means that he is always available, like 24-7. There is not a moment 
There is not a second when God is not available to you and I. There's not a moment when God is not protecting. There's not a second when God is not providing. There is never a moment when God is not watching over you and I. God is everywhere. Look at what Jeremiah chapter 22 says. He says, I am a God who is what? I'm a God who is everywhere. I'm not in one place. Don't confine me to one place. I can be in multiple places all at one time because I am God and I am everywhere. Do you not know that I'm everywhere in heaven and on earth? The God that we serve is the God of the universe. He is a big God. He is boundless. He's infinite. And the best part is that he is with you and I. At all times. And scripture teaches us this idea. It teaches us this concept. It's threaded from the beginning of the Bible to the very end of the Bible. This idea, this concept that God is not just everywhere, but God is with us. He is God with us at all times, 24-7, always being available. If you study scripture, one of the characteristics that are used to describe God in the Bible is this word. It's called omnipresent. Omnipresent. It simply means that we serve a God that exists everywhere all at once. It means that he's present everywhere at all times. Like he can't be limited by space. He can't be limited by, by time. Why? Because he's omnipresent. He exists everywhere, all at once. You can continue to study scripture and you'll see that a name that's, just, that, that's used to describe God in scripture is this name called Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a name that they use to describe God in Scripture. And Emmanuel simply means God with us. He is God with us. We serve a God that is with us. He is present. He is not a far off, distant God. He's everywhere and yet he is with us. You can continue to study Scripture in the Bible and you'll see that there are, there are various names of Jehovah God that describe the nature and the char characteristic of God. And you come across this name. It's called Jehovah Shema. Jehovah Shema is a name that's used to describe the characteristic of God in Scripture. And Jehovah Shema simply means that we serve a God who is there. God that is present. And over and over again in scripture is this concept that God is with us. There's this constant theme that no matter what you're going through, God is with us. No matter the, the difficulties in life that you go through, God is with us. This constant reminder that God is present. That God, he, he, he never leaves us. That God, he'll never bail out on us. He'll never turn his back on us, and there is this constant reminder to not just be aware that God is with us, but there is this longing and this desire for you and I to do more than just have an awareness of the presence of God. But there's this longing and desire for you and I to invite His presence into our lives and into our daily routine, to be involved in our daily actions. There's this desire, not just to be aware of the presence of God. He's everywhere and he's with us, but he also desires to be in us and be involved in our everyday life. Isn't it cool that the God of the universe has a desire and a longing, not just to be around us, but to be in us? And here's the truth. Here's the reminder. If you're taking notes, don't miss this. 
Here it is. <laughs> Life is better <laughs> with God in it. Life is better when God is in it. When we invite the presence of God to be part of our day today, yo, life is better. We only will experience the fullness and all that God for us here on earth when we make a conscious decision that God, I'm aware of your presence and I invite you into my day. We only experience all God has in store for us when we pause. We say, God, I invite you in to this business decision that I have to make. God, I invite you into this relationship issue that I'm dealing with. God, I invite you in to me trying to raise these crazy kids. God, I invite you into this issue. We only experience the fullness of God when we're not only aware of his presence, but we invite him in to our lives. I could sense the skepticism. It's okay. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what scripture says because there are actual benefits that are in store for you and I while we're here on earth. There are benefits in store when we make that conscious decision that God, I'm not just aware of your presence, but in this moment, in this day, in this activity, I'm going to invite your presence in. When I invite your presence in, scripture teaches us that there are actual benefits in store for us. Do you guys want to know them? Here we go. Three benefits from the presence of God in our life. Number one, when I'm worried, God is my confidence. When I'm worried, God is my confidence. Anyone ever been worried? If you're not worried now, I hate to break it to you, you will be. <laughs> when I'm worried, God can be my confidence. When I'm concerned, when I'm afraid, when there are things that I can't solve on my own, when there are things that I can't fix on my own, when I'm in moments in life where there seems to be no way out, when I'm concerned, I can have confidence in God. Why? Because I know that he is with me. You guys remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? These guys, you can read about them in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there was this tension. There was this battle going on with King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar ordered these guys to bow their knee and worship the statue, worship another idol, worship another god. And these guys said, no, we're not going to do it. We only bow our knee to our God. I'm not going to bow to your God. And there was this tension going back and forth. We read about it in Daniel chapter 3. And King Nebuchadnezzar, man, he got so mad. He got so frustrated. He felt like so rejected and embarrassed that these guys weren't following his orders and, and bowing their knee that he ordered a servant and said, go, go get these guys and tie them up. You guys know the story. And throw them in the fiery furnace. But he didn't stop there. He said, throw them in the furnace and then like heat up the temperature like seven times what it typically is. Like I want to, I want to char these guys. He was so mad and he threw uh, these guys in the fiery furnace and you know the, how the story goes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there in the furnace. They were there in a place where their lives were at risk. They were at a place in their life where there seemed to be no way out. They were in a place in their life where they thought it was going to end in death. And what did they do? Scripture says that they began to pray and sing worship on. To God. What did they do? They, in that place, they began to invite the presence of God in that place. And what happened? King Nebuchadnezzar, after a while, he got up and he looked down in the furnace and he was amazed, scripture says, at what he saw because he not only saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but he saw a fourth person that looked like a son of God. Why? Because God showed up when the fiery furnace, when they welcomed his presence in that place. I can have confidence when I'm worried. I can have confidence when I'm in a situation where there seems no way out because God is with me. And this is the word for someone today. You might be here and you might feel like you're in that fire. God brought you here to remind you 
that he's with you. Your situation might be bad, but he is with you. Look at what Isaiah says, 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, what? I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, what? You'll not be burned. You could have confidence in whatever situation you're in today because the God of the universe is with you. Look at what David said in Psalm chapter 16. He says, I'm always aware of the Lord's presence. He's near. And nothing can shake me. You gotta have confidence in the God that is with us. And everything around you might be shaking, but you don't, you won't be shaken because God is with you. Number two, when I'm tempted, <laughs> God is my counselor. Benefits of the presence of God in our lives. When I'm tempted, God is my counselor. Now, none of you are ever tempted, so you could just check out during this next point. But for those of us that are, when I'm tempted, when I'm tempted, God's heart, God's desire is to be our counselor. His heart, his desire is to give you and I strength and wisdom and discipline to, to, to overcome. Like in those moments of weakness when we're tempted and we're embarrassed and we're shamed, the heart of God is not mad. He's not angry. He's like, yo, let me in. I want to be your counselor and help you in this situation when we're tempted. God is my counselor. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Pause right there. Isn't that cool? Like, I think it's funny that sometimes we think like this temptation that we're facing is so different, so unique. It's so rare and no one else has ever experienced this. I was a youth pastor. My, youth, my students used to come. I'm like, Josh, I'm dealing with this thing, and it's so hard. No one has ever experienced. You're lying. It's not rare. People have been struggling with that same temptation for thousands of years. That's why it's so important for community. That's why life groups are so important. That's why we do them here at Active Church. Let me tell you like what most of our life group nights sound like. Oh, you're struggling with that? Dude, I'm struggling with that. <laughs> are your kids do that? My kids do that. What? What are we going to do? Let's figure this out. The temptations in your life, they're no different than from what others experience. And look at what it says. But God is faithful. Aren't you glad? God is faithful. And look what it says. He will not allow that temptation to be more than you can stand. Isn't that awesome? That just encourages me. He will not allow that temptation to be more than you can stand. When, not if, when you're tempted, check it out. He will show you a way out so you can overcome. That's a good place to give God a big hand clap of praise. <laughs> Only those that are tempted clap their hands. God is with you. He's not just with you in the good times. He's with you in that moment of weakness, in that temptation, in that sin. And if you would just invite him into that place, that place of weakness, that place that you're, if you just invite him in, his heart is, I want to be your counselor and I want to what? Show you a way out. Come on, somebody. There is no sin. There is no temptation. There is no addiction. There is no drug. There is no bondage. There is no chain that is greater than the God that we serve. And when we invite him into that place, he's promised to show us a way out. You're not an addict. 
You're a child of God. God created you to win, not be defeated in this life. You can overcome temptation. You can overcome sin. You can overcome whatever it is when you invite the presence of God into your life. And number three, when I'm discouraged, God is my comforter. Benefits of the presence of God in my life. When I'm discouraged, God is my comforter. Look at Psalm 34, verse 18. It says, the Lord is near to those who are discouraged. And he saves those who have lost all hope. Another translation says that God is close to the brokenhearted. And if you're here today, you've lost all hope. If you're here today and you're brokenhearted, God wants to remind you. He brought you here to tell you that he's with you in that place. You may be crushed, but you're not destroyed. You're not defeated. If you invite his presence into that place, he'll heal your heart. He'll restore you, and he'll make you an overcomer. You believe that today? So how do we do it? Here's the secret sauce. You don't love secret sauce? <laughs> no one? I, I was in Oakland this past week and ate at this, like, it was a sketch place. They sold hamburgers, but I didn't know what kind of meat. They, I, I didn't know. But they said, do you want secret sauce? I said, extra, please. I don't know what I'm about to eat. Here's the secret sauce. How do we do it? How do we not just be aware of the presence of God, but how do we invite him in to that place? How do we invite him into our life? What do we, how do we invite him in to those situations that we're dealing with? We do what David did in Psalm 116. We could do today what he did. We can make a commitment. We can make a vow. We can make a conscious decision to do exactly this. Check it out. David said, I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the world of the living. We can make a decision today that God, I want to leave here and not just be aware <laughs> that you're everywhere and that you're all around us. But I want to walk in your presence in this world of the living. And we can make that decision today. God, I'm inviting you in to be involved in all those situations. And when I'm tempted because I'm inviting you in, I can overcome. And when I'm discouraged, I can have confidence in you because I'm inviting your presence into this situation. The band can come on up. We're going to get ready to land this plane, I think is what Pastor Adam says. Dock this boat. I don't know. So how do we do that? How do we make that decision that I want to walk in the presence of God. I want the presence of God to be invited into my daily routine. Like, I don't want to just live and experience the presence of God on Sunday here at Active Church. Like, I want to experience the presence of God in all of my daily routines, Monday through Saturday. Like, how do I do that? Here's three practical steps. I learned it from a, it was actually a monk that wrote this book. The monk's name was Brother Lewis. Like, first name, brother, last name, Lawrence, or Lawrence, I'm sorry, Brother Lawrence. He's a monk that wrote this book. It's called Practicing the Presence of God. And in it were these three practical steps. I thought they were cool. Step number one, practice the presence of God. This is what we can do to invite his presence into our daily life. Number one, learn the benefits of silence and solitude. Like some of us, we're just too 
busy <laughs> to hear from God. And we're just too distracted. We're way too active to hear and experience the presence of God in our life. What does scripture say? Be still and know that I am God. And some of us, to practice the presence of God, man, we just need to stop and silence all the noise and just be still to hear what God is speaking. Practical step. Experience the presence of God is just stop. Be still. And invite Jesus into that place. Step number two, practicing the presence of God. <laughs> talk to God about everything. Like talk to God about everything. He already knows. <laughs> so why don't you talk to him about it? Talk to God about everything. Scripture says, pray without ceasing. Talk to God about everything. Write it down. My daughter has prayer journals in her, in her room. Write it down. Pray, talk to God about everything. Pray to God when you're at the gym. Pray when you're driving your kids to school. Pray when you've got to make that tough decision at work. Pray when you're in that conference room and you don't know what to do. Pray when you're fighting with your wife. Pray when your husband's acting crazy. Pray when your kid is acting like a demon. Pray and talk to God about everything. You know what's cool? God hears our thoughts and he hears our heart just as much as he hears our words. And we like to dilute prayer to, I've got to find my prayer closet and I've got to spend time talking verbally in prayer for one hour. For God. No, 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 no. Pray and talk to God about everything. And he hears your heart. He hears your thoughts even more than he hears your words. So many times I'm at work <laughs> in a situation where I don't know what to do. And I'm not verbally saying it, but in my head, God help me. So many times when I'm raising my kids and I'm in a situation where I don't know what to do, like where is the playbook for this one? And in my head, God, I need you. So many times when I'm in rough situations, my prayers have never been words that I speak. They were thoughts in my head and my heart where I invited the presence of God into that place, that moment. Practical steps to invite the presence of God in your life. Talk to God about everything. And the third, simply invite him in. Invite him in. There's a scripture in Revelation chapter three, verse 20. They're red letters in scripture, and so it's Jesus talking. And this is what it says. He says, look, it's Jesus talking. He says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and you open the door, I'll come in. And I always thought of this scripture, and I've preached this scripture from the context that it was meant for those that were far from God. Like those that didn't know God. Like those that maybe had committed like, like major mess ups, major failures in life. Those that didn't even believe in God. I always looked at that scripture from that perspective that man, that's really cool. That despite what they did, God still loves them. And it painted this picture of a door. And on one side, you see God faithfully patiently waiting and on this side is us is his people just and God's just waiting for us to open the door and allow him in and that's cool but that's not what the scripture is talking about like it wasn't for those that were far off Jesus was writing this letter in Revelations chapter 3 verse 20 and you know who, who he was writing it to he was writing it to the church 
He's writing letters in Revelation chapter 3 to the seven churches. And this is to the church of Laodicea. And he wrote this letter, Jesus' words to the church. Yo, I'm here at the door and I'm knocking and I'm waiting for you to hear me and let me in. It wasn't for those that were far away from God. It was to the church. He spoke those words to people that actually were aware of God. He spoke those words to people that had actually made like this routine of going to the house of God uh, a, a practice in their life. Jesus wrote this letter and he spoke those words not to those that didn't know him. He spoke it to those that were aware of him. And he paints this picture for the church. There's this door. And Jesus is knocking and he's waiting, not just for the world, but he's waiting for the church. He's waiting for the followers of Christ to open that door and let him in. And I think what Jesus is teaching us in this moment, I think what Jesus is teaching his church, I think what Jesus is teaching his followers, that there's a big difference between your sins being forgiven and walking in his presence. I think what scripture is trying to teach us in Revelation chapter three, that there's a, there's a big difference between attending church on Sundays and experiencing the presence of God in our lives Monday through Saturday. And the question today is not so much, are you saved? The question today is not so much, are you forgiven? The question today is not so much is Jesus your savior and has saved you from your sins, but the question today is Jesus savior and Lord of your life. Has he saved you from your sins and have you opened the door and allowed him to, to, to come into your life and be Lord in every area of our lives? Because Jesus, our God, his desire is not to just save us from our sins, but his desire is to be Lord over every area of our life. And he told the church, it wasn't the world. He said, I stand at the door and I knock and I wanna come into that place in your life and make a difference. God is all around us, but he wants to be in us. There's this cool story in Genesis chapter 28 about Jacob. Um, I actually, I, uh, I read this story the first week of, uh, of our rest, of our Sabbath. You guys know the story. Jacob was, uh, he was on the run. He had, he had um, tricked his father and got the family birthright. He deceived his family and he was on the run. Esau was chasing after him. He wasn't in a good place. He wasn't in right standing with his family. He wasn't in right standing with God. He was on the run. Jacob finds himself in the wilderness and he lays down to go to sleep and he uses, a, he uses a stone as a pillow. He's there sleeping in the wilderness, on the run, in a bad place in life. And as he was sleeping, he had a dream. You guys know the story, Jacob had a dream and it was of a ladder that extended from earth all the way up to heaven and there were angels going up and down the ladder. And in that dream, in that place, of Jacob being on the run. God spoke to him and he spoke to Jacob and he said, Jacob, 
Like you're so concerned, you're so consumed with your father's blessings. Dude, you need my blessing more than your father's. God spoke to him, it was a pivotal moment in Jacob's life. I think it was cool that when he was in a bad place, God showed up in that place and he spoke to him. And when Jacob woke up from his dream, there in the wilderness, his head on a stone, look at what he says in Genesis chapter 28, verse 16. Said so Jacob awoke from his sleep and he says, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. I don't know what place you're in today, but God came to remind you that it's not just you in that place, but he is with you in that place. You may be here today in the place of despair, <laughs> but God is with you in that place. You may be here, you may be brokenhearted, but God is with you in that place. You might be here, you don't know what to do, but God is with you in that place, surely presence of the Lord is in this place. And his desire is for you to open the door to your heart and allow him in that place. I didn't share this first service, but I remember, uh, I remember when my wife was pregnant with Luca was six years old now and uh, we'd gone through a series of miscarriages and Sylvia was having a, a tough a tough pregnancy and I remember I was I was in the Bay Area for work and my mom called me one evening and I could tell when she called by the sound of her voice that it wasn't good and she said Josh Sylvia's Sylvia's not good um, they don't know what's going on she's in a lot of pain and they they want to transfer her to, to Stanford Hospital and I was like, I'm, I'm getting in the car right now. I'm, I'm headed home. And she's like, no, like, you're right by Stanford. Just wait there and we'll meet you there. They brought her to Stanford and they ran a series of tests on her. And they didn't know what was going on. And they were trying to figure out how to fix it. And I remember like I was praying. I remember like we even prayed as a family but I remember just being so fearful. And honestly, I remember being mad at God. Like I didn't know if Luca was gonna survive or not. And, and we was in Stanford and like they, they still like couldn't figure things out and they did some, some things and they sent her home and we got home and she was starting to feel better and then all of a sudden like it hit again. And there was just so much like emotion in our house so much fear, so much worry, so much anxiety. And I remember like our family was all in the living room and I just got up and I was like, I'm gonna go take a shower. And I got in the shower. I didn't say anything out loud. There were no words that came out of my mouth, but I just remember thinking, God, my wife needs you. My baby, needs you. And in that moment, <laughs> in the shower, I was crying, but I felt God speak to me. And we had been, there were like two names for the baby that we were debating on. Like I was going for Luca. Sylvia was like Bartholomew or some, some crazy name. I don't remember what it was. But in that moment, I felt God speak to me. Luca means traveler of light. And I felt God just speak to my heart. I said, Josh, it's gonna be okay. That's my child. And I've called him to bring light into this world. And there's no darkness, there's no dark thing that can keep his light from shining. And in that moment, 
everything changed. You know why it changed? It wasn't even because God spoke to me in that moment. It's because when I got in the shower, I silenced that noise in my head. And I opened up the door to my heart and I invited the presence of God to meet me in that place. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? God, in this moment, in this space, our confession is that we need you. We need you. We need you to not just be the God of the universe. We need you to be my God. We need you to not just be all around us, but God, we need you to be in us. And just as David made that decision, we make that same decision today. That when we leave this place, we're going to walk in your presence. We're going to invite your presence into our lives, into our day to day. God, that thing, that space that's not good, that thing that has been off limits, that situation where we've been trying to fix it, God, we invite you into that place. We accept you today as not just our Savior saving us from our sins, but we accept you today as Lord, ruling and reigning and dwelling in every area of our life. With every head bowed, no one looking around, there are some here today. Man, you've never opened the door to your heart to Jesus at all. You've never opened the door to your heart to invite Jesus in and do what only he can do. To do what, man, he is so good at doing. He's, he's so good at taking things that are just jacked up restoring them. He's so good at taking things that are broken and putting them back together. He's so good at when we let him in, giving us a fresh start, a new beginning. Man, if that's you, if you're far from God, maybe you've drifted, maybe you've accepted Jesus as your savior years ago, but you don't have a real relationship with him. Today is your chance. Today is your opportunity. You say, Josh, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I need a fresh start. I need a new beginning. I need things to be put back together in my life. I want to open the door of my heart and invite Jesus in. If that's you, I would just want you to raise your hand when I count to three. We're not gonna have you come up front. We're not gonna embarrass you. I just wanna know who I'm praying with. That's you. you say, Josh, I need a fresh start. I'm gonna unlock that door to my heart and allow Jesus to come in and do what only he can do. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Make Jesus Lord of your life. One, two, three, raise your hand. That's so cool. That's so cool. Hands are going up all over. It's so cool. Church, would you stand to your feet with me? We're gonna pray this prayer. Everyone standing, we're gonna pray this prayer together. No one prays alone here at Active Church. Pray this loud and proud. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for believing in me. I invite you in to my heart. I open the door to my heart. I welcome you in. Make me clean. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a fresh start. Give me a new beginning. Be my Savior and be my Lord in Jesus' name. And everyone said, everyone said, come on, let's give it up for those that just made the best decision.